The conduct of General Duquesne in this matter has been severely commented on, as it was entirely due to his personal pique and jealousy in the affair that this indignity was put upon Flinders. The generous hospitality extended by the British settlement to the French navigators at Port Jackson found no response in this rough specimen of a soldier of the Revolution, who throughout the period of Flinders' detention treated him with studied rudeness and unnecessary harshness. For three months Flinders was kept close prisoner as a spy, and for twenty months as an ordinary prisoner of war. Still, during his captivity in the Isle of France, his thoughts were constantly busied with the projects for the further exploration of the great southern continent he had lately left. In addition to the chafing weariness of prolonged detention and enforced inactivity, he was constantly haunted by the dread that the French would, after examination of his papers, step in and forestall him in the matter. In a letter to Sir Joseph Banks, dated March 20th, 1806, he mentions this fear and, adding, that disappointment and deferred hope of release have in no way damped his ardour in the cause of science, advances for consideration a scheme for exploring the interior of Australia. Though now, after more than 80 years of discovery, have given us an intimate knowledge of the nature of the difficulties he would have encountered, we may smile at the somewhat crude notions of the daring navigator. We cannot refuse to recognise that a good deal of thoroughness was mixed up with his plan, simple as it reads. An incursion of 500 miles north and south respectively would without doubt, if possible, have done much towards an earlier knowledge of the interior. His dream of sailing up a deep estuary, some great waterway, leading to more fertile lands than those of the coast inhabited by a superior race of natives, had vanished. As the shores of the Gulf of Carpentaria rounded his course from south to west and from west to north, so the picture his fancy had painted faded, and he found himself compelled to fall back upon the conception of a mode of transit patriarchal in its simplicity. He writes, quote, with five or six asses to carry provisions, and they can be obtained here, expeditions might be made into the interior of Australia from the head of the Gulf of Carpentaria in 18 degrees and from the head of the Great Gulf on the south coast in 32 degrees until the courses should nearly meet. 500 miles each way would most probably be sufficient since the country does not appear to be mountainous. A view of my general chart will exemplify this. In case of being again sent to Australia, I should much wish that this was a part of my instructions. End quote. Note. Referring to Flinders' scheme for exploring Australia, it may be amusing to the reader to contrast it with one projected some years later by M. Malt Brun. In his case, the amount of material the eminent geographer considered necessary for the expedition is as excessive as that of Captain Flinders was simple. His method for exploring the continent is this, quote, In order to determine these questions, namely the different theories propounded as to the nature of the interior, it has been proposed to send an expedition to penetrate the country from Spencer's Gulf. For such an expedition, men of science and courage ought to be selected. They ought to be provided with all sorts of implements and stores, and with different animals from the powers and instincts of which they may derive assistance. They should have oxen from Buenos Aires, or from the English settlements, mules from Senegal, and domedries from Africa or Arabia. The oxen would traverse the woods and the thickets, the mules would walk securely among rugged rocks and hilly countries, the dromedaries would cross the sandy deserts. Thus, the expedition would be prepared for any kind of territory that the interior might present. Dogs also should be taken to raise game and to discover springs of water, and it has even been proposed to take pigs for the sake of finding out esculent roots in the soil. When no kangaroos and game are to be found, the party would subsist on the flesh of their own flocks. They should be provided with a balloon for spying at a distance any serious obstacle to their progress in particular directions and for extending the range of observations which the eye would take of such level lands as are too wide to allow any heights beyond them 
to come within the compass of their view. The journey might be allowed a year or 18 months, which would be only at the rate of four or five miles per day. The author of the present work, Universal Geography, has discoursed this project in conversation with the enlightened and indefatigable traveller M. Perron, who saw no insuperable obstacle to its probability except the existence of an immense ocean of sand occupying the whole of the interior of the continent, which to him appeared extremely probable. End note. But Flinders was never fated to see the interior of Terra Australis. Either from the deck of a ship or from any point of vantage, he surveyed its shores, suggested the name it now bears, Australia, and left the work of discovery, not even to this day quite completed, to other hands. But though the name of Flinders has not received the worldwide recognition that has been bestowed upon that of Cook, in Australia it should be equally honoured. The land that witnessed his long labours and heroic courage ought not to repay him with forgetfulness. The crazy state of the investigator having compelled Flinders to terminate his voyage abruptly, a considerable space of coastline was still left on the north and northwest that had not been minutely examined. Lieutenant Philip King, between the years 1818 and 1822, completed the survey left unfinished by Flinders, and the work of marine exploration temporarily ceased. In looking back over the early history of Australia, the apparently careless manner in which the English became possessed of the whole of the continent is very noticeable. Although the Dutch had so long been acquainted with our shores, and the neighbourhood of their possessions in Java would have afforded them greater facilities for exploration than were held by any other nation, no attempt at colonisation was ever made by them. The apparent poverty, both of the country and the natives, offered the East India Company no inducement to extend their operations. Still, in a vague kind of way, the Dutch claim to the western portion of Australia was recognised. In the patent to the first governor at Port Jackson, the western limit of New South Wales is fixed at 13.5 degrees east longitude, a position approximating to the boundary of New Holland as fixed by the Dutch whereby the country was divided into New Holland and Terra Australis. This line of demarcation would bisect the present colony of South Australia. In the early part of this century, the French evidently considered that they had a well-founded claim both to to the discovery and possession of the south coast west of Newt's Island of St Peter's. The name of Terra Napoleon was given to it, Spencer's Gulf becoming Gulf Bonaparte, and the Gulf of St. Vincent, Gulf Josephine. Malt Brun remarks, quote, The claims of the English have no fixed boundaries. They seem desirous of confounding the whole of New Holland under the modern name which they have given to the East Coast, which was minutely explored by Captain Cook. It is worthy of remark that the French geographers had, from a comparison of the tracks navigated by Abel Tasman, previously concluded on the existence and direction of this coast itself. End quote. But neither Dutch nor French claims were ever seriously advanced and the whole of the continent and adjacent islands were ceded to the English in much the same happy-go-lucky fashion that we recently let slip a large portion of New Guinea. One cause of the apathy displayed was without doubt the forbidding nature of the reports published by all the navigators. The coastline had been examined and the various inlets followed up without any important or navigable river having been brought to light and the absence of fresh water streams in such a large continent naturally led thinking men to the conclusion that the inland slope was nothing but an arid desert parched beneath the rainless sky. The hot winds that had been experienced on the southern coast aided this belief and the natives, when interviewed, professed no knowledge beyond the limits of their tribal hunting grounds. The little colony clustered around Rose Hill, and on the shore of Sydney Cove was shut in by the gloomy gorges and unscalable precipices of the Carmarthen Hills, that stayed all progress to the westward, and the same frowning barrier had been found to extend north and south. Men's imaginations were exhausted in picturing the physical appearance of the mysterious interior. 
Some thought it a vast level plain where the few and sluggish rivers were lost in shallow lakes to disappear by evaporation. Others again believed it to be an immense bed of sand where no rivers formed and the thirsty sands absorbed the scanty rainfall, and many imagined an inland sea connected with the ocean by subterranean outlets. One and all agreed in its inhospitable nature. There was nothing hopeful nor inspiriting in the outlook to induce men to attempt to penetrate this silent desert, save the love of adventure and the gratification of a laudable curiosity. The convicts, who in efforts to regain their liberty from time to time made desperate attempts to escape, either perished miserably or, daunted by the sterile nature of the land and the hostility of the natives, returned to give themselves up before reaching any distance from the settlement. The work of exploration was toilsome and difficult from the lack of beasts of burden. Each member of the party had a heavy pack to carry, and when to that was added the cumbrous firearms and ammunition of those times, a day's journey was no light labour. The weary system of counting the paces all day must have considerably added to the monotony of the march. 2,200 paces over good ground were allowed to a mile. When, too, nature had barred the way with an apparently insurmountable range, it is not to be wondered at that the area of explored country was not very widely extended during the first 20 years of settlement. In striking contrast to other portions of the world's surface that have been slowly explored and examined by the European nations, Australia has throughout retained a character of its own. From the coastal formation of most lands, fair indications could be obtained of the character of the interior. Large rivers gave evidence of a defined system of drainage. The crests of snow-topped mountain ranges in the distance were proof of whence these rivers sprang. The native tribes were of higher intelligence, had a partial knowledge of what lay beyond their immediate ken, and could show articles of barter and commerce that they had obtained from more inland residents. Australia was a silent and sullen blank, and for a century of exploration nature has resisted, step by step, the encroachments on her stronghold, making the invaders pay toll with many a gallant life.